Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Burgess for convening this hearing and including important public health legislation, including my bill, the Keep Food Containers Safe from PFAS Act. I'm appreciative of the inclusion of a witness from my district, Dr. Kwa Ping Chua, who is a professor at pediatrics at the University of Michigan Medical School. His background and expertise will help the committee better understand the intersection of opioid policy and orphan drug policy, and we are grateful to have him with us today. We look forward to learning more about these important issues as we work to ensure that Americans have access to these potentially life-saving drugs. We thank Dr. Chua for his time and pioneering work in this area and the opportunity to learn from his expertise. I'd also like to express my appreciation again for the committee's wisdom in inviting a professor from the greatest public university in the world. Go blue. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, in my bill, the Keep Food Container Safe from PFAS Act is one of the bills that we are uh, considering or having hearings on today. With the passage of the PF, with the PFAS Action Act earlier this month, the committee has taken big strides needed to kickstart the cleanup of legacy PFAS contamination, limit discharges of PFAS waste into air and water, help community water systems upgrade their infrastructure to filter out PFAS, and much more, though we need the Senate to act for it to really happen. However, one of the more troublesome exposures to PFAS that often goes unnoticed is the use of these chemicals in food packaging. Last year, Congress took an important first step in the NDAA bill to ban the use of PFAS in food packaging for MREs. My bill, the Keep Food Containers Safe from PFAS Act, would build on this success to provide FDA to deem PFAS substances in any food containers or cookware unsafe. So I'm going to direct these questions to uh, Ms. Benesh. But Ms. Benesh, what do we know about the health effects of PFAS in food packaging? Does FDA have a safety threshold for PFAS that it uses to calculate how much PFAS in food is safe? Um, so we do know that PFAS migrates from food packaging into food. Um, and we know that some of the health effects broadly associated with PFAS chemicals include some kinds of cancers, um, and then at much lower doses, reproductive harms, developmental harms, and reduced effectiveness of vaccine. Um, what's really concerning to me is FDA has said it is using EPA's reference dose for drinking water uh, for PFOA and PFOS, which are two of the uh, food packaging chemicals that are no longer being used. But for all the PFAS that are still in food packaging, um, they, they have not calculated a uh, reference dose, and so they're using the kinds of assumptions that they apply to other chemicals that don't operate in the body the same way that PFAS do. And so I'm a, I'm a bit at a loss of how FDA has uh, determined that these chemicals are safe without determining what their safety threshold is first. So if Americans currently have concerns about PFAS, which I think they should, and food packaging, can they shop around this problem if they're looking in PFAS food packaging? Um, unfortunately not. Uh, unlike the ingredients in food that do have to be on the label or the ingredients in a cosmetic product that have to be on the label, uh, there's no requirement that the ingredients in a food packaging material have to be on the label. So it's very difficult to avoid if consumers do want to shop around it. Has FDA ever withdrawn a food contact notification for PFAS chemical on its own? Um, no, only in response to industry abandonment, but never uh, on its own because of a health concern. Is that why we need Congress to do something? We do think that Congress needs to step in because FDA hasn't appreciated the urgency of this issue. Um, no one knows better than Michigan uh, how, how urgent this problem is um, and how overburdened many communities already are. You know, it's not just Michigan, though, just as you say that. We've tested for it. Flint water taught us something. As other states start to test, they're going to be as bad as Michigan, which is what's so scary. And food isn't just marketed to Michigan. It's marketed in every state. Are industry safety data backing up new approvals of food contact substances made public by the FDA? They are only through the food contact notification system, which is the way that FDA has approved uh, food contact substances since 1997. You can only get that underlying scientific information through a public records request. It's not easy for the public to access. I'm going to ask you one more question because I'm going to run out of time. But I don't think people um, 
understand this. I want to put something to bed that often gets raised. If we designate PFAS as hazardous substances under CERCLA, which we need to do and haven't, or Superfund, would food companies no longer be allowed to use PFAS in food packaging? Um, thank you for the question, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. We couldn't agree more uh, that PFOA, PFOS, and other PFAS chemicals uh, urgently need to be designated as Superfund chemicals um, under our hazardous substances law, but Superfund is a cleanup law. It has no bearing on the use, uh, other uses of PFAS in commerce, and we have looked at this issue um, and found that 80% of the roughly 800 hazardous uh, substances under Superfund are still in commerce, and many of them can continue to be in very wide production. So the only way to ban PFAS in food packaging is to ban PFAS in food packaging, as you've proposed. Which is why we need the bill, and it's in the blood for everybody here of 99% of the people in this country, and they don't know it. Thank you very much, and I yield back.